So let the wives be, be subject to their own husbands and everything. To want to do that. It's a, a submission is uh, not only in verse 22, 23, but in verse 21. Submission in the Bible is commanded by God. And yet God wants us to be volunteer, uh, wants us to volunteer it. I want to be submissive to Jesus Christ. I get up in the morning and I want to follow his will. Don't you? I get up in the morning and I want to represent him. I don't get up in the morning and go, I cannot believe what I signed up for. I have to follow Jesus Christ again. The guy has a huge ego problem. He died. He rose again. Everybody praises him in heaven. And he still wants to tell me what to do from, from the throne. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And, and you know what? It's amazing because he, because he has never hurt us because he has never had ill intentions towards us you haven't always liked what jesus has done by the way has he ever done something you didn't like i i guarantee it and he'll say to you in isaiah 55 hey my way's not like your way say lord i ask you to do this and and and, and i ask you to do it sort of this way and you went all around and the Lord does things, all, even though he's perfect, he does things all the time that we don't understand or appreciate or even are aware of. But we, we've got to be in that. And the reason I say that is because if for somebody to say it's easy to submit to the Lord, that's not true. It's hard. Nobody wants to be told what to do. I don't like it. I don't like it. I tell you, good leadership uh, understands how to try to give people the ideas of what you want them to do. Find out what they want to do. Let, let's keep moving on, though. Husbands, love your wives. Now, this one is, is very easy to follow and very consistent. Just as Christ also loved the church. Is this uh, puppy love? Is this emotional love? Is this romantic love? Well, the first thing it says is, and he gave himself for her. I will die for my wife, men say. Why don't you help her in the kitchen? That's what she needs more right now. <laughs> right? I mean, you can only die once for the woman. And then you're no good to anybody. And so, what, what, when the Bible says to die for somebody, it isn't just to lay your life down and give it up. It's to lay your priorities down. 1 John 3.16 says this. That's what love does. It lays, it lays our life down. We want to love our wives with a biblical love and we want to be like Christ who loved the church, who loved the body and he gave himself for her. He was always motivated by what was best for the body, his followers. And I started thinking about this and I, I don't know where it came from. It is somewhere in my past. I remember somebody telling me, I don't even think it was in counseling, somebody tell, telling me that my wife wants me to rub her feet every night. Can you believe that? Well, I could... I could believe it. It sounded like a good idea. I wish I'd have thought of that, you know. I like my feet rubbed too. Not a hint after the kissing illustration, all right. <laughs> but I started thinking about that. It popped in my head. And I think the reason it popped into my head is because in John, and husbands, I'm talking to you and me. Because in John 13, Jesus Christ did not rub the feet of his disciples. He washed them. And they were putrid. And they were stinky and sweaty and they didn't have shoes like we had. They had sandals and sweat and dirt and grime. And he got on his knees and got a bucket out and put a towel around his shoulder. And he got down and began washing the feet of his disciples. That's how husbands ought to love their wives. You want me to rub your feet? Yeah. Why don't you wash them while you're there? <coughs> Metaphorically speaking. Ladies, some of you may not want that. But I think you know where I'm coming from here. And, we, and today, see, we're evaluating marriage, but we're not evaluating it based on the standard that I just gave you. We're not doing that. We don't have that attitude. We don't have that heart. By the way, uh, isn't it interesting that everybody, everybody that went into anybody's house in that day would need their feet washed, but none of the disciples thought about doing it for each other. So it isn't just that Jesus did it. It's that his disciples didn't do it. And then in John 21... We just studied this in the men's group Thursday. In John 21, he shows up at the Sea of Galilee looking for Peter, who's left the calling to fish for men, and he's fishing for a fish again. And Jesus is on the shore, and he hollers at him, and John says, Peter, it's Jesus. And he jumps in the water, and when they get to the shore, Jesus is cooking them breakfast. 
And, and that's probably the, the easiest thing to miss in that whole passage because of the miraculous catch of the restoration of Peter, of all the other kind of things, or the recommissioning, whatever you want to call it, that gets left in the dust. The Son of God started a fire on the beach and He made breakfast for His disciples. Husbands, are, you, are, we, are we listening to this? These illustrations of Jesus. We ought, we've got to do this. We've got to have that kind of servant love. Servant love. It's, it's get your hands dirty. Do whatever it takes. Give yourself to her. Verse 26, that he might, and he did this, that he might sanctify her, that he might set her apart, that he might make her holy and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, and that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Here, let me just summarize this really quick. Husbands, our responsibility is to be to our wives what Christ is to the church in this way. Because you got involved in her life, she's better than you found her. Now you think you found her pretty good because you married her. And it's our job to make her better than we found her. Uh, what was condition were we in when Jesus found us? Can we not say 100% that, that, that everybody that got involved with Jesus is better than they were before they met him? Now let me throw myself under the bus because this is not an encouraging sermon for, for many of us, for maybe all of us, because we fall short. How many of you guys feel convicted right now besides me? I, I mean, it's, I'm telling you, I'm under, it's incredible conviction. And when I met Alexis Albright, formerly Albrecht, a little argument there in the family that somebody, they wanted, some of the family wished they'd have kept the German background, Albrecht. She's, she's Alexis Albright. And I met her. She was in pretty good shape when I met her. I was captivated, you know. Uh, she might be watching today, so I don't want to tell the story. Uh, about the first time I saw her in this blue dress. And it is amazing. Never forget it. I found her in pretty good shape. And I have made her better in some ways. She is more uh, aggressive in evangelism. She's great in evangelism, but she's more verbal and she's just, there's some ways I've made her better, but I'm, I'm standing before you and God to say there's some ways I've, I've not made her better. I'll see how she'll react to something and I'll say that is exactly how I reacted. She got that from me. Can we be honest? We're in church, right? Are we going to just dance around the issues? Are we going to just say the bottom line is, men, we've helped our wives some and we've hurt them some. Amen? Yeah. And I just, when I see her and I know, I know all you ladies think she's perfect and she's pretty close. But when the, her imperfections, most of them she got from me. And I go, ooh, what's wrong with that woman? And the Holy Spirit goes, she, she's just acting like you. Yeah, that is how, I, when I don't get my way, that is sort of how I act. Well, you know, I don't know. I don't want to go to church and just be patted on the head. I, I want to change. I want to change. And I hope you do too. And it's tough out there. The devil wants to divide the church. He wants to divide it. And what do we do in a divided church and divided marriages? We've got to love them. We've got to love them. We've got to love them. I mean, so many people are busted, up, busted today and broken up and divorced. And, and where do they go to find hope? Are they going to go to the bar? Are they going to go to the church? Where do we, let's decide, church. Are, we, are they welcome here? When people don't make perfect decisions and, and things break up, will the church receive them? If we won't, where do they go? Where do they go if they don't come here? Yeah. Yeah. If we let them here, does that mean we're okay with everything? No. This is a haven for broken people. A haven for people. And we, we, you, don't tell, you don't go to intensive care after somebody's been in a car wreck and get in their grill and say, did you have your seatbelt on? Was the accident your fault? You just get them better. Just get them better. Galatians 6 says that we need to, to, to restore those that are caught in sin. And be careful restoring them. Gently restoring them. Bearing their burdens less, uh, and fulfilling, uh, fulfilling the law of Christ. And then it says, because everybody's going to bear their own, there's still consequences. There's a lot of things going on here. One is, what's the model? The other one is, 
where do people go when the model's broken and busted? They got to run to God and we've got to receive them. Verse 28. So husbands ought to love their wives, own wives, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. It's like the second great commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. What would you do if your roof fell and you got ripped off in a windstorm? You'd get up there and fix it. Well, your neighbor's roof has fallen off. Go over there and help them. That's what we ought to do. When your wife's hungry, you're hungry. When you, she's thirsty, you're thirsty. I told you the story and I'm not proud of it, but it's just so typical. And we, we were, we were, she was pregnant with Zach, who just turned 18, to give you a time frame. And we were going from Billings, Montana to Missoula, Montana. And it's a beautiful trip. It's a long trip, but it's beautiful. And there's really nothing there. And, and uh, there was no speed limit. 